also need health care that addresses the social context, not just treats the, 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 the medical organ that's sick, the, or the organ that's sick, but try to treat the individual as a whole person. Give you one example, um, uh, the Nurse Family Partnership uh, program is an example. Um, it's a program that takes low income, highly vulnerable, typically pregnant teenagers, and has randomized them to receive a visit in home from a nurse. And the nurse begins these visits prenatally and continues through the early years of the infant's life. Um, they've been done in upstate New York with low-income white women, in Memphis, Tennessee with African-American women, in Denver, Colorado with Latina women. And the control group receives prenatal care. So the study is looking at what's the impact of having a nurse make a visit compared to routine prenatal care. And in some of the variations of the study, the women also receive the transportation voucher to get to prenatal care. The nurse making the visit doesn't just deal with the pregnancy. She deals comprehensively with the challenges that young mother faces. She counsels her about maternal employment, about educational opportunities, about relationship with a partner, about parenting skills. And what this research shows is that program leads to improved outcomes for both the mother and the child. And that even though it's expensive to send a nurse to make a home visit, there's a $17,000 return to society for each family served. So the program actually saves money for the society. The point I'm making, we broadly need to think of how we not only treat illness, because if we treat illness and simply send people back to live in the same conditions that made them sick in the first place, we haven't made much progress. And so we need to find comprehensive ways to more comprehensively address the social challenges that individuals face. An example of that is the Medical Legal Partnership, born at the Boston Medical Center Safety Net uh, facility in, in, in the city of Boston, um, where uh, Dr. Zuckerman um, established this um, almost 20 years ago. And what happens for a pediatrician working at a Boston Medical Center is when a patient comes in, this pediatrician can make referrals to other specialists. But among the specialists that this pediatrician can refer to is a lawyer, a paid, unstaffed lawyer working for the hospital. It's part of the medical team. You see, if a child comes in with asthma because that child is living in a mold-ridden environment and the mother has had no success in getting um, the landlord to do anything about the molds in the apartment, it does make a difference when a lawyer calls. The Medical Legal Partnership told me that they are able to get 60% of their patients who were denied food stamps or SNAP to get food stamps after they have resubmitted uh, the, the application. So it's a dramatic way of trying to deal with the larger issues that shape health and healthcare expenditure. There's a new book out um, by the Medical Legal Partnership called Poverty, Health, and the Law. Health Leads, another program born in the Boston Medical Center, that uses college students as volunteers to work at the help desk. And they ask four questions of everyone coming in to, this, to the hospital. If they have needs in the area of nutrition, or housing, or utilities, and so on. And then it is a job of that undergraduate student volunteer to go out knowing the patient's address and find the resource and link that individual to the resource as a way of more comprehensively addressing the health problems that they face. To improve America's health, we also need to make healthier choices. We need to improve in terms of our nutrition and smoking, exercise, reduce alcohol misuse. We need to make behavior changes is crucial. So let me illustrate that just in the area of nutrition. The government has been telling us for some time that each of us needs to eat five servings of fruits and vegetables a day. I looked at recent data from the CDC 2010 to see how well we're doing. And even the college educated in the United States, not even only 35% of college educated are getting two or more servings of fruits per day or less than 35% getting three or more servings of vegetables a day. And you know what the government has, has said? Based on the recent, most recent data, National Cancer Institute says we we'll now need nine servings of fruits and vegetables a day. Five is not enough. If you want to dramatically reduce your risk of chronic disease, 
reduce your risk of cancer. We need nine servings of fruit and vegetable a day. This is from NCI's website trying to tell Americans that you know, it's actually possible to get nine servings a day if we be more active and think about it. The China Study is a book that, on nutrition that lays out the challenges of nutrition and the problems of malnutrition in the American society. And it says that the epidemic of chronic illnesses in America is caused by three fundamental factors, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> True, that's, that's the point the, the China study makes. There is growing evidence from very carefully peer-reviewed scientific research that we can, Dr. Esselin from the Cleveland Clinic, who has shaped uh, Bill Clinton's, um, uh, changed his nutritional behaviors, that we can actually prevent and reverse heart disease, well documented in the medical literature, just by diet. We can prevent and reverse diabetes, even among insulin-dependent diabetics, uh, Dr. Neil Barnard's work shows, simply by diet. There is enormous opportunities for us to improve our health. Research suggests that for the first time in our history, America is facing the prospect of raising children who will live sicker and shorter lives than their parents because of the obesity epidemic if the obesity epidemic remains unchecked. There's a lot that we need to do. But the research is also clear that simply just say no campaigns will not be enough. We need to think of not only the individual responsibility and the choices we have to make, as a society, we need to think about social responsibility and think of the ways in which we can create the opportunities that promote good health for all. The ways in which we can remove the barriers that many Americans and many communities face where they don't even have the healthy choice. And if you look at our success, limited success with cigarette smoking, it took multiple sectors of society using multiple interventions, using the law, using uh, the media, using economic inducements, to address the problem of cigarette smoking, and even so, we've only been successful. So that even today, lung cancer kills more American men and women than any other cancer. Lung cancer kills more American women than breast cancer every year. In fact, lung cancer kills more Americans every year than breast cancer, prostate cancer, colon cancer, and pancreatic cancer combined. So there's still enormous opportunity. Some of my current work is looking at the relationship between stress and smoking. And we find that people who currently smoke are on the markedly heavier levels of stress than people who don't smoke. So comprehensively addressing smoking, we need to deal with the underlying factors that are driving the behavior in the first place. What I'm saying is we need to move upstream. And we need to realize that where we live, learn, work, play, and worship, and the opportunities to be healthy in those environments have more to do with our health than going to the doctor. Medical care as practiced in the United States is a repair shop. It takes care of us once we get sick. It has little to do with whether we get sick or not in the first place. So while we want to have good medical care, and while we want to have access to good care once we get sick, to really improve America's health, we need to have a greater emphasis on prevention. The CDC estimates that only two to three cents out of every dollar spent on medical care in the United States is spent on prevention. 97% of our medical care dollars is spent on curing individuals who are already sick. What drives health is the relationship between the conditions in which we live. And we need to think of how we can make it's easier to make healthy choices, how we can build a culture of good health. What that really means is that health policy is not just what doctors do and the healthcare system does and public health people do. It's policies in every sector of society that has health consequences that affects health is in fact health policy. So how do we improve America's health? The best way to improve America's health and to reduce our medical bills would be to invest in schools and sidewalks and produce markets and preschool programs and parks and jobs and housing and transportation. Those basic elements of improving the environment are some of the most powerful ways to improve health.